topic for today is understanding and interpreting GWAS data. Um, and uh, it starts off with the premise that we are interested in human individuals and that we're interested in their phenotypic variation that they exhibit. And if it's well measured, we may be able to uh, convince ourselves that it's worth performing a genotype to phenotype association study by trying to figure out those genes that are underlying that phenotypic variation by looking specifically at their genomic DNA. And it's a big place. So in the last few years, genome-wide association studies have really uh, enabled by a variety of technological advances, have enabled us to take a stab at this question. How does DNA variation associate with phenotypic variation? And this is basically a summary of the past four years for genome-wide association studies, starting with uh, an international collaborative initiative known as the HapMap Project, the International HapMap Project which documents exactly where are common polymorphisms in the human genome and in such a way that it tells us something about the correlation structure of those polymorphisms. And um, that has really led to the commercial development of these genome-wide SNP genotyping arrays. And I, I actually, the only thing I had to change this morning about this slide was the number of how many loci were discovered. And I, probably it's an underestimate, so I don't keep track anymore. Um, but what's very clear, um, despite what some commentators uh, may tell you, is that this endeavor of taking these DNA samples and comparing uh, cases to appropriate controls, or if you're studying a quantitative trait such as height, uh, or blood pressure, that it is possible, if you have large enough samples, to find robustly genetic variations um, that influence the phenotype. Um, and we'll basically, for the remainder of the talk, we'll, we'll try to cover the technical aspects of what's uh, enabled um, uh, such discoveries in GWAS. The, the first caveat uh, of GWAS, as we have seen it for the past few years, and which is pretty much a limitation of the HapMap resource. Hi, Mark. Oh, oh awesome. Now, this is service. He's, yeah. <laughs> um, um, this is how we do science here at the Broad, by basically giving people a lot of coffee. Um, limited, care, uh, limited, limited coverage of, uh, for variation of low frequency, including rare variants. And this is, of course, why we are so interested in sequencing technologies at larger and larger scale, uh, because that will provide us with a way to start asking questions about that slice of the allele frequency spectrum um, uh, that G was, was or is unable to do. <clears throat> now, at the basis of genome-wide association study and at the basis of the HAP map is the fact that there are many polymorphisms in the genome. Roughly, on average, one in a thousand bases are heterozygous if you were to take two random chromosomes from the population and if you were to put them side by side and ask, you know, where are the DNA, uh, where are, show me where the differences are at the base level, at the nucleotide level. And it's roughly one in a thousand. And the number may fluctuate depending on where you look. Um, and it turns out that when you look at nearby polymorphisms, and this is a cartoon, is that there's correlation between these polymorphisms. And we've got a word for this. The word is proxy. And so if you genotype one SNP as a marker, it acts as a proxy for other surrounding SNP next to it. Um, and it does, though, it does so, and this correlation structure is basically referred to as linkage disequilibrium or 
the Lelic Association. And it's this very phenomenon of linkage to equilibrium in the human genome that enables us to do these genome-wide association studies by relatively efficiently picking markers uh, as a function of what the linkage to equilibrium structure is now that we have HapMap, right? So there was basically one large activity that showed us this is the correlation structure and this is you know, and if you pick them, if you pick the markers carefully, um, I can be very efficient about my uh, genome-wide association study, and this is exactly why uh, this effort has been so successful. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. So you're using the common SNP terminology. Yeah. Um, well, there's a couple of things. I think the most, uh, uh, well, a very relevant uh, um, consideration is one of allele frequency. You know, right now we are sitting here with hundreds of people, and uh, if I were to, uh, you know, make, build a bigger lecture theater and pack thousands of people in there, I would be able to find those polymorphic sites that vary at lower frequency uh, just because I was able to look at more people. So I think we now make a distinction, now that we are so focused on sequencing technologies, we're making a distinction between SNPs of high frequency, and I think what most people uh, tend to think of is a, an arbitrary cutoff of 5% or greater. And uh, one of the, actually a very simple reason for that is take HapMap, Take one of the populations that was uh, represented in HapMap, uh, the CEF, the Utah residents with northern and western European ancestry, uh, sampled by the CEF. CEF is a French institution. Um, and they had collected 30 trios in HapMap. So 30 trios, so you've got mom, dad, and offspring, 30, so each person has two chromosomes because we're diploid organisms. So this means that you have 120 unrelated chromosomes of European descent. Now, if you have 120 things of something, it probably means that those things that, uh, that occur at 5% or greater, you've probably sampled them quite well. And you know we can numerically test them, we know this. And of course, stuff that doesn't happen so frequently is not going to be covered so well. So here's a very simple mathematical explanation why, you know, why there are limitations to HapMap and why there are limitations to the commercial platforms that have been developed based on HapMap. So that's a frequency answer to your question. Um, uh, it, how, they, how, they, uh, how Illumina and Ephemetrix then selected markers specifically will depend on the platform that we are considering. But for, for example, a very early generation platform, the Illumina HumanHap 300, at 317,000, I think they rounded it down. I don't, I mean, if you're a real marketeer, you round it up. But, uh, so 317,000 markers based on the LD structure in the CEF. It turns out that LD structure, there's more correlation in European population than in the African population. So they felt that why not first build a platform that gives good coverage in European population um, uh, and that, of course, really fed into a frenzy of all sorts of disease, uh, uh, disease genetic studies uh, of European cohorts. I hope I answered your question. Um, and really, once you... So here is a cartoon again of a region in the genome, and the vertical tick marks are SNPs that have been genotyped in your sample of cases and controls. And really, what all we are doing in a GWAS is at every such genotyped SNP, we're asking, is there a significant allele frequency difference of the SNP, so for the two alleles, in this particular case, an A and a G, between cases and controls? Of course, things will randomly fluctuate, but then, you won't, it, then it won't be significantly different. So you really need... Uh, the, uh, a large allele frequency difference before you can actually claim to have found a true association. And I hope I'll 
make that clearer when we start to talk about p-values and such and significance levels. There is a variety of tests that one can perform to, to do this, basically to test is there uh, a difference between cases and controls at this very SNP? And it, I think what we've come to realize is that you don't trust the result if only one method tells you it. All right, so that's for dichotomous traits, the cartoon. Now there's also quantitative traits that we're interested in. I already mentioned height. Who has seen the recent Nature paper? That's uh, by Joel Hirshhorn and many, many of his, uh, of his collaborators uh, in Nature. I think it was last week or two weeks ago. And then we can use linear regression by regressing, on <clears throat> by regressing the phenotype on the, the genotype. Uh, for example, here, and I, of course, overemphasize the effect here, people who are carrying a GG genotype are much lower in the quantitative trait of interest than people who are heterozygous or homozygous T. Now, because we are only genotyping 317,000 markers on the human hep, you know, 300, to refer it back to, uh, to the good old days. This is only three years ago, so. Um, uh, what we're banking on is not so much that the genotyped marker is the disease variant and all biology will basically explain itself. No, we're not, 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 so, uh, not so lucky. What's going on is that <clears throat> because of LD, the existence of linkage disequilibrium, the existence of correlation between variable sites in the human genome, we're banking on the fact that the genotype marker sees the association through linkage disequilibrium at the, a nearby causal site that, of course, we don't know about. In many cases, it might not even be on HapMap, and we're going to have to do resequencing and fine mapping to figure out exactly where the signal is coming from. This is really the obstacle where people are now. You know, with all the GWAS, with all the more than 1,000 loci having been discovered, with complex traits and common diseases, we are trying to find out what those causal variants are. That's basically, I could wrap it up here and say that that's the problem today. <clears throat> but this gives you an understanding of what's happening with LD. If, there, if the R squared, which is a quantitative measure for the linkage equilibrium between the causal variant here in this picture and the genotype marker, if it's low, you're never going to be able to find a significant allele frequency difference between your cases and controls. Uh, and therefore, you know, you may miss this causal variance. So immediately, this, uh, uh, this brings forward the notion that the power to make discoveries of these genomic loci that are underlying the trait of interest is a function of how well we are, you know, SNP genotyping across the region. Ideally, you would have sequence information, right? Because then you could just test every base in the genome. And, and that's exactly what, you know, uh, what people are thinking of now, is like how we could treat such a data set, how, what we could do. That's very, so that, in that aspect, it's, GWAS is fundamentally different from if you had complete sequence information. <clears throat> of course, linkage to equilibrium doesn't go away. That, that, that stays. All right, so I already mentioned power. So what are the determinants of statistical power to make a discovery? There's a couple of uh, parameters that are important. Some are fixed by nature. Some of them we can work on, and I've summarized them here. And the equation on the bottom is something that depending on your caffeine level, you may ignore or not. Uh, the things that are fixed by nature are how strong is the effect. If I have the allele, by, you know, what's, by how much does it increase the likelihood that this person or that I will develop the disease? That's the effect size. Uh, you can express it as the beta coefficient if you're doing regression modeling or relative risk or odds ratio, you know, if you're, you know, if you're familiar with the general two by two table uh, for association. Um, but that's, of course, fixed by nature. We, we have absolutely no, we can make assumptions about that, but we don't control it. Same for the frequency of the causal variant. We don't know that ahead of time. 
And there's this whole debate of, you know, is it all common variants? Is it all rare variants? Is it something in the middle? Probably is something in the middle. That it's, a, it's a mixture of a lot of things. Anyway, but what can we work on? I think four years of GWAS has made it very clear that more is better in two domains. One is if you have more patient samples and more control samples to compare them to, that's good because you just have more observations. I think that should be very obvious. And the way this enters into the equation is big N on the left. If uh, the expectation value of the chi-squared, which is our test statistic, grows if N is larger, so that's good. So power, so basically the expectation value of the chi-square, you can see that as a proxy for power. And power goes up if N becomes bigger, and also if gamma is bigger, gamma is the effect size, P is the allele frequency, one minus P is the allele frequency of the other allele. And R squared is the R squared that I already mentioned. How is the genotype marker tagging the effect of the causal variant? So all of those things I think make intuitive sense and you should speak up now if you, if you disagree. Um, very early on, as soon as we had HapMap, we were able to ask questions like, and this I think uh, more quantitatively answers your question, you know, how should we be designing these chips? Because there's a lot of SNPs to choose from and more is better, but that sounds kind of simple. Is there anything we can do? Well, what I'm showing you here is with respect to those SNPs that have been uh, genotyped in HapMap, in these three analyses panels, so uh, CEU, that stands for the CEF, so European Ancestry, the YRI, the Yoruba from Ibadan, Nigeria, the African continent, and a combination of two East Asian populations, the Han Chinese from Beijing and the Japanese from Tokyo in Japan in, uh, on the bottom right corner. And what you're seeing are, the, uh, are these bars that basically tell you, as a function of the commercial chip, how many of the SNPs am I capturing with a high R squared? Okay, so of all the SNPs that are on HapMap, recognizing that none of these chips are genotyping all of them, I want to know, for the ones that are on HapMap at least, how well do I do? How well is each SNP tagged uh, by the SNPs that are on the chip? So it's basically a large sum over a pairwise function for every marker that is being genotyped, how well does it tag each of the surrounding SNPs? And you basically do that across the entire genome. And here are the numbers, and it was pretty clear that already from an early generation product such as the, the FAMetrix 500K and the uh, Illumina Human Hap 300, that by far the majority of common variation was tagged very well. So more, you know, around about 80% or greater that was captured with an R squared of 0.8 or greater. What was also immediately clear is that if you now point to, if you now uh, look at the YRI results, the Yoruba, uh, so African ancestry, is that the result was much less, you know, well, wasn't as good. And I think here it's also uh, nice to reconcile the fact that the human hab 300 was specifically designed with respect to the CEU data, whereas, and it really does markedly worse than the Affymetrix 500K, whereas in Europeans it's sort of comparable, right? So you can clear it, so that, I, I guess it makes sense that they, of course this is not you know, necessarily a good thing, but this is how they were designed at the time. And it, it, uh, and it was just a very, sort of a semi-quantitative way to figure out you know, how, are, do we feel confident enough that if there are common variants, and if they do play a role in complex traits, that we can perform these association studies in a, in a robust way without missing too much of the genome. And the answer to that is we feel pretty confident that we can. Now, it's a very different picture for the not so common variants, and I'm not even going to talk about rare variants that only unique people carry or that only pr are present in uh, specific pedigrees. That we'll, that we'll need sequencing for. But we can say something about you know, those polymorphisms that happen to uh, be in HapMap that had a slightly lower frequency than the 5% that I just mentioned and as that arbitrary cutoff for what's common and what's not. And again, you, you know, by, by looking at the, the height of these bars, 
uh, you can do the, very much the same thing. You know, how, how much is actually being tagged at high R squared, which is our figure of merit, uh, for now two uh, FEmetrix products. And, you know, for many of the uh, lower frequency polymorphisms, you don't do so well. And that was not a surprise because that wasn't the design goal of HapMap. But, you know, we wanted to know how, you know, how bad is it? So it was pretty bad, and this is why, you know, we're now not talking about HapMap anymore because that's dumped on a website somewhere, and we're interested in 1,000 genomes because we want to, you know, look at more people. This is where 1,000 genomes, due to its success, has already become a misnomer because many more than 1,000 are actually being characterized uh, in this effort. So that's all very encouraging. Now, coverage of these chips does not measure power. What do I mean by that? Even if, um, you know, you were to whisper into my ear that the causal SNP that, you know, functionally at the biological level is influencing disease risk is on the chip, even if it is, right? Um, that, that still doesn't guarantee that I have, that I will make the discovery. Uh, very simply because of those other parameters in that equation. The, the R squared may be one, and that's the highest it can be, but you know, that doesn't mean that I'll actually see it with genome-wide significance, which is uh, what I'll cover in a, in a slide or two. So that's what I just wanted to, uh, to highlight. Now, I think this slide is becoming, uh, I, usually when I show this slide, I sort of apologetically say that, oh, this is an old slide and I should really update it, but I actually become, I have become more, you know, the more we do complex trait genetics, the more I appreciate that in 2005 they had to make, uh, and this was, of course, this was, of course, pre-GWAS era, they had to make a table, and this is from Nature Reviews Genetics, and they make those, you know, they do them for you, you should know, and so, you know, I, I can see the debate that they were having, and this, this is from a paper by John Todd and David Clayton and colleagues, and it's now so painfully obvious that on the y-axis that the numbers really don't reach into the thousands that we are now have become uh, used to. Uh, a, a good example is that Nature paper of height as a phenotype, uh, where you know more than hundred thousand samples were needed to elucidate, you know what is it more than hundred loci? Uh, I think which is an incredible result. But it goes to show that you know, our, what perhaps would have been our earlier estimates or assumptions of what the effect sizes we may be able to find in the genome, that they really don't exist. It's much more modest effect sizes that, uh, that are now coming out of these GWAS efforts. Um, but it shows you also intuitively that here as a function of the frequency of the disease allele and a function of the presumed effect size, the odds ratio here, going from 1.2, relatively modest, to 2.0, relatively strong, uh, that you, know, you vary the sample size required to reach uh, something like genome-wide significance. All right, so this is all the theory behind it, and I'll stop there. Um, uh, not with the talk, but the theory part of the talk. How are we going to genotype? Well, we have covered the various chips, so they differ in their various, uh, in their SNP content and density, and of course, uh, you'll, uh, some of you may know that the later generation uh, gene chips contained uh, also probes for uh, copy number variation, and that's been, that's been very uh, insightful as well because it would be wrong to give the impression that SNPs is the only relevant type of uh, genetic variation that, uh, that we should be studying. That's obviously not true. It's just that it's a very simple type of variation that we can study, and it, it happens to account for most of the variation in the genome. I think that's a fair statement still. Um, now, with a lot of experience uh, in, you know, genotyping these SNPs, the problem of calling genotypes um, has not actually gone away, certainly not for lower frequency variations or even rare variants. And uh, here on the top right corner is just an illustration of, you know, what, what might lead you astray uh, in the context of structural variation. So on the x and the y axis is the intensity of the probe that, kept, that, that tags the C allele for a given SNP. And on the y-axis is the A allele for a given SNP. 
And so you nicely have those three genotype clusters, A, 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 C, and C, C. Well, what about the C hemizygote? You know, that would really fall in intensity on the y-axis um, because there's no A to be detected. And this person would have, so every dot is an individual, and this person would have a single C, so it would be roughly on the same level as the AC heterozygote. But how do we deal with this properly in a, you know, in a systematic way? And this is actually still sort of an unsolved problem, uh, mostly because these measurements, uh, they do suffer from noise, um, and uh, especially for low-frequency uh, polymorphisms, you just have very few observations. So how do you know something is real or when something is just noise and should have been clustered in, in those nice three AAACCC um, you know, blobs. All right, so that's, so I just wanted to put that, uh, just want to highlight that that's still uh, a problem that people are working on, uh, especially as the focus shifts towards low frequency polymorphisms. Now, probably all I have to say about the next few slides is that, and actually for the remainder of the talk, is that quality control and the filtering of these data is probably the, is the key and critical step in genome-wide association analysis. Try to highlight uh, what the various parameters are that we have to uh, check for when we are looking at missing data in samples, when we're looking at uh, uh, relatedness between samples, especially in those studies where you think that you've collected only unrelated individuals, but it turns out that people are related, maybe not brothers and sisters, but you know, more distant relationships. And it's, it, this always happens that, uh, you know, unexpected relatedness. You have to uh, check for contamination, and one way to do this is to check for the heterozygosity for your samples. You've got to look for population outliers. With this, I, I'll give an example uh, uh, later. Um, and if you are studying families, why not check for Mendelian transmission, right? If you have mom, dad, and offspring, the observed variation in the offspring should be consistent with Mendel's laws. And they have been around for a long time. At the SNP level, again, you don't want to trust SNPs that have a lot of missing data. Why? It's because apparently it was problematic to get accurate calls uh, in your entire sample for that given SNP. So that's uh, very clear that with increasing missingness uh, of a SNP, that the quality of that SNP deteriorates rapidly. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we have population genetics to tell us that the proportions of the AA, AB, and BB genotypes should happen in certain ways. Uh, and uh, you can formalize this in a numerical test. When you're doing a case control study, you want to make sure that that missingness between cases and controls is not, you know, is not very different. Um, and you can, again, check for Mendel errors and, uh, you know, for how uh, consistent the observed allele is with respect to the haplotype background. That's actually a test that has become a little bit less used now. It was, uh, all of these things are, by the way, in, in, in Plink, uh, a tool that Sean Purcell developed uh, quite a few years ago now and that many people have used for GWAS analysis. Now, this is a very old slide from one of the earliest, uh, if not the earliest, GWAS performed here at the Broad uh, in a type 2 diabetes um, uh, project where we had used the Afrimetrix gene chip 500K that you'd already seen on those HEPMAP slides. And you basically see, I won't go through them all, but basically you see here that, you know, it's important as the analyst to keep track of, you know, what are you filtering away and why and what are the thresholds used and at the end of it, you're hoping to arrive at a very clean set of SNPs that you can then test for association, something that I'd already conceptualized earlier. Okay, so I think um, the title of this talk is the interpretation, or this is understanding and interpreting GWAS data, and uh, it, it can either mean that you, either, that you have to do it yourself, so maybe this will help you do your own GWAS, and can I have a show of hands of people who have done GWAS analysis, okay, a couple of hands, that's good. Um, uh, but it could also be, the question can also be, the title can also be interpreted to mean, you know, what, 
how should I read a GWAS paper? How can I, you know, what critical eye should I develop to judge whether a paper is a load of rubbish or not? And I think that um, probably the important question that any GWAS paper should convince you of at a very technical level is uh, whether they've done their QC correctly. And of course, every study will have its own details and you, know, you may not be able to judge exactly by if they give you the parameters that if that was good or bad because they may have, they may have, they, they had to make decisions based on the data that you don't have access to. But what you can ask yourself is does the distribution of the test statistic look okay? The distribution of the test statistic that, you know, that tests what's the relationship between the genotypic variation and the phenotypic variation for all your SNPs or for all the SNPs that, you know, are being described in the paper. And basically, are there any signs of inflation or deflation of this test statistic distribution? Uh, uh, do you, is there a departure in the tail? Is there anything that basically looks out of the ordinary? Because that's what we are trying to figure out, right? When you look at this data, the data set is massive, not as massive as sequencing data, but it's already quite big. Uh, you want to know uh, how surprised should I be? That's basically always the question when you do this kind of statistical exercise, when you look at a lot of data. If you, if you think you, you're, you found something, you should always ask yourself, how surprised should I be of having found this, given that I have performed this study? And you can always, so the rest of the talk you can frame in that fashion, like how surprised should I be? What's my expectation of what the data should look like? All right. Um, uh, the, the last two questions, and I, I realize that you, the bullets don't really show up, but basically do we have uh, any genome-wide significant hits? Is more like a question that pertains to biology. Like, okay, so what's really come out? What are the loci? And that, of course, I'm not going to cover here in this talk. Um, uh, but uh, what I will cover is, you know, how do we define genome-wide significance? And um, uh, for a given locus, uh, uh, what can help us uh, give more, uh, what can give more insight at a given locus if something was found there? Now, a key study um, was performed in 2007, actually 2006 and 2007, published in 2007, the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium. If you haven't read it, you should, to get a very good glimpse of what does it mean to do genome-wide association study. So they've taken um, a, a large uh, set of controls, 3,000 of them, and used those to compare to seven different phenotypes, each 2,000 samples large, so 14,000, so divided by seven is 2,000. So you basically are, uh, this paper describes seven genome-wide association studies, one for each phenotype. And this is the visual summary of it. Um, these plots are known as so-called, are, are known as Manhattan plots. From left to right, you've got nicely lined up every SNP in its p-value as a function of where you are in the genome, so chromosomes one on the left and the sex chromosome on the right. And basically, the p-values are plotted on the negative log 10 scale so that if you have a very significant p-value, it should be very high, all right? And those are actually the green uh, coloring uh, I think that's where they, uh, where they define genome-wide significance. And you can clearly see, this is the nice thing of doing multiple diseases, you can make some sort of, you know, qualitative statements at least about, you know, how these diseases differed in this very large experiment. So, for example, bipolar disorder and hypertension, nothing came out out of that particular study. So maybe that leads you to believe that the genetic architecture, you know, is much more complicated and you're not going to find very strong signals at any one given SNP, something that, you know, very, uh, is very different from, for example, the signal at the chromosome 6 locus in rheumatoid arthritis and type 1 diabetes. And that was already known, so, I mean, in that sense, this study didn't really tell you anything new. But that was, uh, I'm just trying to clarify what they were seeing. So that's the very sharp peak on chromosome 6. Um, well, but perhaps for the, for the purposes of our, you know, understanding and interpreting GWAS data, it's, uh, 
it's, it's more interesting to look at, um, to go back to that question of, you know, what should the data look like? So the 3,000 samples that they had used as controls were 1,500 samples from the UK 1958 birth cohort. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, that's a cohort that's uh, uh, very, uh, used very often for various studies. And another 1,500 from the um, blood services. And um, so what they did was to compare here, you're looking here at the Manhattan plot that corresponds to the genome-wide association study of comparing the first 1500 to the latter, to the, to, to the second 1500. And basically, you know, nothing is genome-wide significant. So now I also know that what makes, what makes green isn't quite genome-wide significant, but some lower threshold to basically mark it as interesting. But basically, this is the distribution that they got. And, um, uh, but, but it doesn't really t tell you, you know, how, how, how many SNPs have a p-value of, say, you know, less than 1%, how many SNPs have a p-value of, let's say, you know, 10 to the minus 5. And so a, a different way to look at this data is a quantile-quantile plot, which tells us a little bit more about the statistical distribution. Alec. Ah, uh, there's none. So it's a great question, sorry. So this is, in a way, a bit, uh, uh, when you read the paper, they preface this by saying, well, we first wanted to know how, you know, how things behave. And so this is where, this was really a euphemism for keep our fingers crossed, people. Because if you compare 1,500 random folks from the UK, and if you compare them to another 1,500 random uh, people, you shouldn't really expect to find anything. Unless the two samples are not well matched. But certainly from a disease perspective, there nothing was being, nothing was being targeted. So I guess what I'm trying to uh, uh, implant here is the idea that uh, by looking at this kind of experiment, it gauges what, it, 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 it gives us an expectation for what the data should look like under the null hypothesis of there not being a genotype to phenotype uh, relationship. Does that make sense? So it's basically uh, a very expensive way. I'm just that's I'm just kidding. To 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 teach us statistics of what should the distribution look like for 500,000 SNPs, and after QC, it's like 370,000 SNPs. Okay, that's, uh, well, uh, this is, so the def, I, will, I will come to, the, I'll actually, I'll come to that, yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think, I think what you're forcing me to say now, before I uh, flip to the next slide, what's, how am I doing on time? Oh, I'm doing good, okay. Um, what's, uh, I want to know, and I don't have a pointer here, but the, you know, on chromosome two, you've got the green dot there, right? I want to know how, how surprised should I be? I said that before, you know, that's the question you should always ask. For any one of these SNPs, you should ask yourself, how surprised should I be for that particular SNP? Like, oh my gosh, let's write a nature paper, or maybe not, all right? And I, I guess what a quantile, quantile plot will tell you, and this is why I think this is a key tool, so this is a very important slide in this talk. Uh, the quantile-quantile plot gives us insight as to whether the distribution across the genome deviates from what I, what I expect uh, 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 under a theoretical null model. Um, and how do I make a quantile-quantile plot? Well, I do that by, for every SNP that I had observed in that, you know, slide from the, from the, previous, from, from the previous slide, I am plotting the observed chi-square, so this is not p-values, but chi-squares, by the way, uh, but I'll sh soon show that that doesn't really matter. Um, you're plotting the observed chi-square as a function of what I expect under a theoretical one degree of freedom chi-square distribution, and we have and we know what that looks like, 
okay? So what this means, the fact that it, all the SNPs line up on a perfect diagonal, that means that no SNP I should be surprised about, right? Because they're, they're all, as you know, in bulk, the entire distribution is behaving according to the theoretical null distribution of a one degree freedom chi-square, where every SNP was basically tested for association to case control, but haha, we know that it wasn't a real case control study, it was a control control study. So this is, so this is great, and of course, this was the moment where Peter Donnelly, you know, phew, we, you know, we are able to, we can nail this. Um, now let's go uh, into the, your, because thanks for bringing it up, Alec, the definition of a p-value. Under the null hypothesis of no association between genotype and phenotype, right? Nothing to do with disease. This is the distribution of p-values that you should expect. It's uniform between zero and one. I mean, you know, so any, so first of all, this means that anybody who writes a paper with p-values greater than one or less than zero, toss it out. I have seen it happen, by the way. I'm not kidding. No, I'm, I, I have. All right. Um, okay, so it's a uniform distribution, and what, it, what this means as a consequence, is that if I am performing 500,000 tests, you know, I expect half of them to fall on the left of 0.5. And if I carry out, uh, oh sorry, if I performed 1 million tests, 500,000 of them under the null should have a p-value of less than 0.5. 50,000 should have less than 0.05, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just linear, right? You can just cut it across. So now I'm showing you a QQ plot, but slightly different scales because we now go back to our familiar p-values. You're plotting, again, the observed uh, negative log 10 p-value as a function of what you expect under the null. And we know what that is because I just showed you what that is. It should be uniform. So um, it should be the diagonal, and here I'm showing you data from our type 2 diabetes, GWAS, in 2007, and it nicely you know, lies on the diagonal, and you hear me saying nicely, it's like, yeah, but that's consistent with the null hypothesis, so you know, how good is that? Aren't we interested in genotype-phenotype associations? Or yes is the answer to that, but I first want to convince myself that the bulk of the distribution, pretty much like 99.9% .9 of the entire experiment behave the way it should. So this is why, you know, considering the null hypothesis is still a very useful thing, because we assume that all of the interesting type 2 diabetes biology that we are, you know, that we are uh, investigating, that most of the genome is not related to that. And therefore, it's interesting to look at the bulk of the distribution or in the bulk of the SNPs of the, that are being genotyped and tested for association. All right, so how can you rule out potential sources of bias or error? Well, first you want to convince yourself, I mentioned this before, is that if you get a result with one method, you should always test it with another method. And what we did for that type 2 diabetes project was we took two uh, methods, one Plink, the other one is Eigenstrat, and we basically asked, are they giving the same p-values? and we get a nice correlation, 95%, uh, that tells us that basically whatever p-value we're computing, it's, it's robust uh, against the method, and there wasn't some software bug you know, that we had to change Sean for, or Alcus for that matter. Um, I gotta remind myself that these things are being taped, but anyway, um, I, I think everything I said is, is, uh, is, is fine. Um, uh, genotyping quality, uh, well, this was pretty much early days. I think we are much more confident now that the genotypes, the calls that are coming out of, you know, uh, of these chips, uh, that we, are t we tend to believe it much more readily right now. But, you know, early stage in the game of GWAS, we wanted to convince ourselves that those 114 SNPs um, uh, that we saw in the GWAS 
we had to technically validate them to convince ourselves that they would actually give us the same p-value or that the genotypes would be uh, similar. And they were. The overall concordance was 99.5%. So this basically tells us that that's sort of the limit of uh, the accuracy of these GWAS platforms or sequenome. You know, and actually, HapMap has shown very similar numbers. It should be, it should be north of 99%, but it isn't 100%. You will always, if you look at enough SNPs, you will always find some discordant calls uh, between platforms and methods. And you know, uh, this is actually also the reason why studying rare variation is such a hard problem. Because if I'm interested in a 0.1% variant, you know, how do I do that? I don't know, we are, we're not talking about sequencing, but I just wanna, you know, implant again yet another thought that, you know, these methods aren't perfect, and therefore you gotta consider the errors that occur in the data. Um, I'll just skip this. Here's another QQ plot. Uh, something that I didn't really focus on is that if you are plotting on a negative log 10 scale, it means that 90% of all the data lies within this, or should lie, within this lower left quadrant. 99% should lie within this lower left quadrant intersected by the 2-2. Why? It's because one on this scale and on that scale corresponds to a p-value of 0.1, negative log 10, so one means 0, 0 0.1, 2 means 0 point, uh, 0 0.01, 3 means 0 0.001, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what does this mean? Under the null hypothesis of there being no genotype-phenotype association, I should expect 90% of the SNPs to have a p-value of uh, greater than 0 0.1, and that's what's being plotted here. And 99% of the SNPs, I expect to have a p-value of greater than uh, 0 0.01. And that's what's being plotted here. So the bulk of the, the mass of the distribution is basically sitting here. And visually, it's not very clear you know, if there are any, you know, how do I see if I have to, you know, we have a huge auditorium here, and do I, have to look, do, I, do I have to see anything here, you ask me? Well, you don't ask me, but I'm asking myself, and it's like, no, you don't have to, because the, the way we're plotting this puts much more emphasis on what's happening in the tail of the distribution, because, we, because that tells us, you know, where, you know, because that's where the interesting biological action is. If you have a genome-wide significant hit, it will be in the tail of the di uh, di distribution with very low p-values, and therefore marching towards the the upper right corner of the QQ plot. Um, so what can we do about the bulk of the distribution? And this is where the, uh, the genomic inflation factor comes in. So for each paper that you are now reading, you're able to understand its QQ plot and able to judge whether something looks good. But I haven't really given you the, the tool to figure out, you know, but what about the bulk of the distribution? And this is what the lambda does, the genomic inflation factor. The lambda is defined as the observed median of the test statistic. So that comes from your data, chi-squares, for example. And I divide that by the expected median of the test statistic. And I'm telling you now that for a one degree of freedom chi-square test statistic, the expected median is 0.455. So, um, uh, so, so basically it gives you a relative measure, this lambda gives you a relative measure for how the entire bulk of the distribution, because we're looking at the median, is either inflated, greater than one, or deflated, less than one. And for most GWAS, I think we are pretty happy with you know, values on the order of 1.05, or you know, something less than 1.10. All right, and I'll sum up later you know, what can happen, uh, what, ha uh, you know, what are the factors that can you know, make lambda go away from one. One of them is batch effects. If I'd taken cases and controls from totally different parts of the world, that's population stratification. Elkus Price, uh, I'm pretty, I, I think he's on this primer schedule. 
uh, and uh, he, will, he will talk more about that. Uh, but what about technical batch effects? What if, I all, if, what if I take cases and I genotype them in the winter here at the Broad, and then I wait six months, uh, hire a couple of new people, and then do, genotype all the controls in the summer? That's, that's bound to lead to systematic differences between my cases and controls, and that can confound your association results. Because remember, for asso genetic association studies, you're looking for anything that's different be, uh, at the genotype level between cases and controls. So you gotta make sure that you're treating your cases and controls uh, you know, as, as similarly as possible. And that's usually a logistical problem for you know, carrying out these case controlled genetic association studies because sometimes you may not have controls or you may not have collected them or the, or the hospital has got them in some shared space. And there are various reasons why this may not you know, happen uh, under ideal uh, uh, conditions. So I'll just skip this for the sake of time. Very nice p-value, you know, the lambda, very small, 1.005, but departure in the tail. Okay, so is that good or bad? Well, uh, if you look at the, the, the loci uh, that come out, they're all genome-wide significance, and once you c condition on them, uh, the QQ plot drops down to the diagonal. So that basically got the, the stamp of the seal of approval. Here's a study not so good because you've got very early departure. Uh, you know, the, in the bulk of the distribution, it already goes away from the diagonal. And also, when you actually compute lambda, it's pretty high, 1.14. All right, so what, what can cause this? What can cause lambda to deviate from the null? Inflation, lambda greater than one. That's actually the most common thing that can happen. Um, conceptually, what it means is because when you're doing a chi-square uh, test between cases and controls, anything that induced a difference between cases and controls will make the chi-square look more significant because, hey, they are different, and you did something differently to them. So you know, anything that, uh, where, you're, uh, where there are differences between the cases and controls, can lead to inflation, so the chi-square will become, will become bigger than what you would expect under the theoretical null. Population structure I had already uh, alluded to, relatedness, if I'm simply taking, you know, uh, duplicating people by perhaps pipetting badly, um, this can happen. Uh, again, we talked about the winter and the summer of the cases and the controls, or perhaps my cases are all from the 1960s, and my controls I've collected fresh last week. That's also bad, because it means that probably the, the quality of the DNA of the cases is much, much worse than for the controls. So, and that leads to this idea of differential missingness. This is why you should test for that. All right. Uh, case in point, when we uh, took a, an interesting case sample, the phenotype doesn't matter here, and a control sample ascertained and genotyped independently, uh, but from the same country, we basically found this QQ plot, a lambda of 1.4, and a SNP as the top signal at genomide significance, two times 10 to the minus nine, which is basically <laughs> eye color. It's D calls all variant for eye color, so hugely uh, uh, has been subject to popula population differentiation hugely. And the, a classic demonstration of population stratification, which I'll uh, not go into any further. Um, last thing I'll, I'll mention is you know, the fact that we are testing multiple hypotheses in the genome. So where should we draw the cutoff? Well, I think uh, certainly uh, empirically from the uh, experience of Canada gene association studies, um, uh, there's lots, the genome is a big place, so the prior probability of a true association as something that you happen to be studying is vanishingly small, even, in what, even if you think it's a promising Canada gene. So you definitely have to keep in mind that, uh, should I be surprised by something? The answer is, well, probably not, because, you know, I'm testing so many things in the genome, and uh, uh, it's, it's, bound to be a false, it's bound to be a false positive. So I, th I think it's very important to be conservative here in terms of the interpretation of the p-values that come out, even after you've convinced yourself that the, uh, that the bulk of the distribution behaves like, sh like it should. 
Now, how do we get to 5 times 10 to the minus 8? So that's typically referred to as genome-wide significance. In any given population, you have roughly 10 million common SNPs. Goes back to what do you call common? Well, take some arbitrary cutoff for, you know, 1%. Um, uh, Bonferroni tells us that uh, to maintain an alpha level, a type 1 error of 5%, all I have to do is set a p-value threshold for every single test at 0.05 divided by the number of independent SNPs that I'm testing. Now, uh, so if you have roughly 10 million common SNPs in the population, uh, factoring in LD, well, let's just simply assume that one SNP tags 10 others. So I can divide my 0.05 divided, uh, divided by a million, and I end up with my nominal p-value threshold of 5 times 10 to minus 8. That's where that comes from. With many more sophisticated analyses, that happens to be, uh, that number happens to be supported, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is very uh, consistent. And by, by uh, adhering to such strict uh, statistical criteria, you know, many studies, as, as I've shown you, uh, have found uh, robustly replicating associations. Here's just one example. Uh, you know, each individual study here, DGI, Fusion, Wellcome Trust, you know, hovering around genome-wide significance, but when you pool the data together, it's overwhelmingly genome-wide significance. And this is basically the general picture that emerges from GWAS, you know? So you need meta-analysis, and I think that it almost, given that it's such a routine tool now, uh, given that the effects are so modest, Investigators are forced to put their data sets together, which is a good thing, uh, but it means that meta-analysis becomes like the critical tool to make it all happen, and obviously we don't have time to go through that today. So I think I'll stop there uh, and, um, and just point out that, you know, look up uh, Murphy's Rule on Wikipedia, because if you don't make your association signals disappear, others will do it for you. On that note, thank you. <laughs>